Honestly, you don't know what a privilege it is for Diane and I to be here today. Uh, this church is legendary. Hello? Do you realize that you're known throughout the world as one of the vibrant places in the UK where Jesus is at home, where he is ministering, where his power is being released? And, and uh, I don't know, we've known each other probably seven or eight years, maybe, maybe ten. I think I first met Dave, your son, gosh, probably more than ten years ago. Anyway... We've had a long history. I've read his book. I've, I've, you know, we've talked several times, you know, on Zoom. We've seen each other at conferences. But now we get to be here, and it's just such an awesome privilege. And uh, I am so amazed at just the time we've had with some of the leaders around the region, you know, the, the men of this church. I just, uh, you know, when I was worshiping a few minutes ago, and wasn't that great worship, by the way? I mean, come on, the presence and power of God in this place is just so uh, tangible, it's so palpable. Uh, but as I was worshiping, I just, I just felt like the Lord spoke to me and said, there is a sound of victory in this house. There is a sound of victory, and, and my mind immediately went to a, a, a little chapter 7 in Judges where Gideon is having this... Uh, encounter where you, you guys know the Gideon story. He was hiding and the angel appears to him and says, you're a mighty man of valor, calls him forth. And then he assembles an army, but God whittles it down to almost nothing. And then he, uh, but there's a, there's a moment where they're, they were putting torches inside of a, a, a jar and they were surrounding their enemies. And then they had shofars, they had trumpets. And I felt like the Lord said, the trumpet sound is here in this house, the sound of victory. And I felt like I saw each one of you breaking the jar and the light that was, that was hidden is now blazing out to Wolverhampton. It's not just Wolverhampton, it's the nation, uh, uh, you know, and then beyond. I believe that the Lord has a national calling for the church. I mean, obviously, your local responsibility is great to bless the people of this city, this region, but... I believe there's a national call. There's also a global calling in this ministry. I'm so ha happy, so thankful that we get a little piece of that, that Diane and I get to participate a little bit with that. And um, anyway, so thank you for having us. It's been a joy. All right, so, but I want to talk today about relationships and revival, okay? And uh, I really want to emphasize relationships because I know you're in a season where relationships matter, right? Where you've been taking this issue very seriously. You've been spending time together as a congregation, thinking about what does it mean for us to connect? What does it mean for us to love one another, to bless one another, forgive one another? And there's this relational, um, I don't know, this relational strategy that God is giving you. And I want to add a little piece to this because I believe that the Lord, first of all, loves relationship. He's a relational God. He is a God who calls us his sons and daughters. He is a God who is so near to us. But he also has designed his kingdom in such a way that you and I are related to one another. We're family, Right? We're family with one another, and we're still, in a sense, discovering our family members. We have brothers and sisters in Christ, maybe even in this church that you have not met yet. But God has called us to walk together and to work together and to be interdependent with one another in a way that produces um, amazing outcome for his kingdom. You know, my wife and I, uh, we've been married, this month we'll be married 43 years, we have seven children and seven grandchildren, and so we are blessed. Um, but actually, both of us came to the Lord, uh, Diane, a little bit sooner than I did, about 50 years ago. And I don't know if any of you have seen the movie called The Jesus Revolution. Okay, one of you did. Anyone else? Yeah, we see. So I had a, I had a discussion with a couple of the leaders here in the church, and, um, and they just watched it last night because I talked about it a couple days ago. And uh, this, this movie is absolutely worth two hours of your time. Much better than binging on some regular show. 
Okay, I'll just, I'll just guarantee it right now. Because what you will see in the movie is a depiction of something that happened around 50 years ago that changed the planet. That a group of people were touched by the Holy Spirit through an amazing set of circumstances that you'll see revealed in the movie. And because of that, a revival took place that is now called the Jesus Movement or the Jesus People Movement that really swept the whole planet. It was from Australia to Germany, you know, just all across the planet, Canada, U.S., and, and just so many nations were touched by this amazing thing. But it, it depicts a little piece of it going on in Southern California. And if you know this, you know that during that period, about three years running, that around 300 people every weekend were being baptized. Now, just allow that to blow your mind a little like, just put your hands right here and go, because it is something that we haven't seen in our generation at this level, where we've seen literally every weekend, you know, eight or ten pastors out in the cove, and Diane was baptized in that very cove a year after the movie ends, and, and people just going out, being baptized, coming back in, going out, being baptized, coming back in, that there was 300 people or so every weekend. So thousands upon thousands, in fact, it's estimated that as many as four million people came to Christ during that time. Phenomenal, amazing. And uh, I believe we're on the verge of something very similar. In fact, it might even be 10 times the, the beauty of what happened then in these coming days. I believe that you know, many have prophesied, many have held to the idea that there is going to be an amazing explosion, an amazing visitation of the Holy Spirit, and that people are going to start awakening to their need for Jesus. And I believe that we get to be a part of that. This is an amazing time to be alive. It's an amazing time. But we're also in a challenge time. There's, there's challenges all around the world economically, politically, in terms of culture and some of the dynamics that are taking place, the, the disregard for, for uh, biblical principles that have really been permeating our culture for so many years, that we're in a season where I would call it a, an Isaiah 60 season, where the scripture says, arise and shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. But it says, but darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness will cover the people, but the Lord will arise upon you and his glory shall be seen upon you and the nations will come to the brightness of your rising. We're in that moment and there is a sound of victory in this house and I just declare it right now in Jesus' name. I believe we're on the verge of something so awesome that you're going to be so happy you lived in this moment of history. Amen? So let's dive into the Word of God. I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 5. And um, I want to talk about relationships and revival because I believe we are on the verge of another major move of the Holy Spirit. And I want to encourage us to prepare our hearts. And one of the primary ways that we prepare our hearts is through relationship with one another. Your connection to those around you is critical for the coming harvest. If we knew we were pregnant, I mean, my wife and I seven times had this notification, a baby's coming, and immediately everything changes. Immediately, you start thinking differently. Immediately, you start planning your calendar differently. Immediately, you start planning your budget differently because you're pregnant. A baby is on its way. Well, let me tell you, babies are on the way to this house. Spiritual babies, spiritual sons and daughters are about to arrive in this place, and we need to get the, 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 the room ready. <laughs> we need to buy the nappies. You know, We need to get this thing together. We need to get the cribs because ultimately... When the flood of new believers comes in, every single one of us is called into action. All hands on deck, because all of us are going to be needed to connect with these little ones, with the ones who are just, you know, they may be older in life, but they're going to be infants in terms of spiritual things. And they need spiritual mothers and fathers to guide them into the beauty of Jesus. Amen? So, let's turn... <laughs> 
to Luke, and I want you to look at this passage, and we're going to start here. This is just a picture that we'll begin with, but ultimately we're going to get real practical towards the end of the message. How do we build relationships for revival? But let me just read this to you first. It says, so it was, verse 1, that as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. And they saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them, and they were washing their nets. Now, in the Matthew version of the story, it says that they were mending their nets. In other words, uh, you'll find in the story that they had been uh, fishing all night. They had caught nothing. In fact, look what it says here in verse 3. It says, they got in, uh, it, Jesus got into one of their boats, which was Simon Peter. Now, he became one of the lead apostles in the whole uh, journey of Jesus on the earth. But they got into the boat, and uh, he asked him to put out a little bit from the land. He sat down, and he taught the multitudes from the boat. In other words, there was, I, I know some of you have seen The Chosen. They had a little, a little crowd gathered there, but it was apparently a very big crowd because Jesus had to get a little bit away from them to speak to them from the boat. And so here he is speaking. And after he had stopped speaking, verse 4, it says, he said to Simon Peter, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered him and said, Master, we have toiled all night. We have caught nothing. Nevertheless... You know, you don't know what you're talking about, Jesus, but nevertheless, just to humor you, you know, just to, you know, patronize you, I will do what you say. So he said, nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, so their nets were breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. Now, you guys get the picture. It's a beautiful story. And then when Simon Peter saw it, he got back on the land. He fell on his knees, and he said, Depart from me, Jesus, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish, and so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And so Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. You will be fishers of men, he says in another translation. And so when they had brought their boats to the land, they forsook everything and followed him. Now listen to this story, because this is a parable in a way of revival. That ultimately, I know we've been in a season where we've seen God do wonderful things. There's been healings, there's been blessings, deliverances, salvations, baptisms. Thank you, Jesus, for all he's been doing. But there have been seasons throughout history where God has moved in an extraordinary way. There was multiple ten times beyond whatever is happening in the normal day-to-day -day life of churches. And when God does this, it's a season where we need to stand back and just behold the glory of the Lord. We need to understand. But many of us have felt this, both in our personal lives and in our ministry lives, that we have labored all night and caught nothing. <laughs> I remember when Diane and I first experienced uh, the outpouring with a vineyard. And we had gone through a season having been saved during the Jesus movement, seeing all this great power and presence of God and baptisms. And then we went through a lull where the tide went out and it wasn't quite as strong. And I remember the Lord spoke to us from this passage when he called us to plant a vineyard church in San Francisco. He said, yes, you've been laboring all night, but put in your nets one more time. And I want to challenge each one of you. I, don't, I know, well, I, I, I was going to say, I don't know what you've gone through. Actually, I do. Because we've all been going through a challenging time. This last season, I mean, economically, it's been challenging. COVID was so challenging. Our children have been, you know, challenged by the isolation and the difficulty that all of us went through. Our churches went through disruptions and difficulties. I mean, we know that it's been a hard time, and, and we've been continuing to labor in the Lord as best we can. We've labored all night, but then the Lord speaks to these guys and says, hey, trust me one more time. Hope again one more time. Allow your... Your skepticism, allow your, uh, your suspicion to be suspended for just a short period while I reawaken hope within you that God is about to do something way beyond. 
And look what happens. They, they were mending their nets. They were just kind of like, okay, this has been a hard night. Our nets, we have to clean them out because they brought up a bunch of seaweed. We have to clean them, but we also have to mend them because they end up actually fraying and getting broken. And, and so we have to bring them back together. Otherwise, the, they can't catch fish. Now, let me just spiritualize this for a moment. This local church is like a boat. And you are like the net. That your relationship to one another, the ties that you have to one another, is like the net that when it's cast into the sea will catch the fish that Jesus has prepared for salvation. To the extent that your net is unclean, or to the extent that your net is frayed and broken in places, will be the limitation of our ability to actually welcome the new babies into the house. You know, jumping analogies right there, but you guys get what I'm talking about. That there's a, there's a net that God has prepared for the harvest of fish. He says, don't be afraid, follow me, I will make you fishers of men. That there's something about this house that is called to bless this city. And that there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people who don't know their right hand from their left, as it says in the book of Jonah. There's people who have never encountered Jesus before, and we are a place of refuge for them. We are a place of blessing and salvation for them. We are a house within which they can be welcomed into our family and actually be raised up from spiritual infancy to spiritual adulthood and fruitfulness. And this is the beauty of relationship, is that it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It doesn't happen with a lecture alone. It happens because people open their hearts like strands of string within the net, and they tie off to one another again and again and again and again and again. And then we put our nets into the water and we pull up a harvest of those that are longing for spiritual reality. They're longing for truth. They're longing for forgiveness. They're longing for salvation. And we're there for them. And so I believe there's something about this story. But I believe that we need to be like Peter. And once we've brought the great catch of, of fish in, we need to recognize, Lord, please forgive us for our unbelief. Please forgive us. We're sinful in that we don't always believe. We don't always trust. We don't always allow our hearts. We, 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 sh we guard our hearts against hope because we don't want to be disappointed again. But I believe it's time for us to check our hearts, to change our hearts, to allow our hearts to be refreshed again that God's about to do something and we get to be a part of it. Can we allow our hearts to open up at that level? He says here, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. You know, this, this, this call that he gave them also in Matthew, he said, follow me. And we're following him. We're following the best we know how. But he says, follow me unto an outcome. I will make you fishers of men. Now, let's, let's just talk for a minute about this tension we have between revival and relationship. Okay, there is a built-in tension. There's this issue of, if we talk about revival as mission, okay, we have a mission. We have the Great Commission. Jesus said, go and make disciples and baptize them and immerse them in the very heart of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In other words, we have a mission. Teach them to do everything I've commanded you. These are the things that... This, this responsibility belongs to every one of us in this room. Every one of us, no matter how young you are in the Lord, this is our mission together. But there's also a need for community and connection and family and relationship. And how do we balance those two realities of mission and community, community and mission? How do we bring them about? Because I have needs. I need you. I, I need the church to help me. I, I've come here because I was broken. I, I was hurting. I, I was lonely. And, and somehow I found a family. But I also realized that beyond my needs, 
are the needs of a multitude. And that creates a sense of mission. So how do we balance these two? And uh, some people have, have coined the phrase, we are a missional community. Okay, that's interesting. Because that captures the idea of fellowship, relationship, and purpose. A missional community. Another friend of mine, I don't know who exactly came up with the phrase, but we are a family on mission. Can you guys hear that? That we're not just here for us, we're here because God loves every person in the city. And so his love, you know, we may think he's focused on us, we may be sitting at his feet in worship and we're making eye contact with Jesus, but then we notice actually every so often he's looking over there. He's not just looking at me. He's looking at somebody who's hurting here and somebody who's in poverty here and somebody whose body is, is falling apart over here and needs healing and somebody who's trapped by, by demonic thoughts and suicidal thoughts that needs to be saved over here. And that Jesus' focus is actually on every single person. Every hair on our head is numbered, the scripture says. He knows every single one of us and even those who are at the worst distance from his presence. He knows them and he loves them. And so we have to see this tension. We are people of mission, but we're also people of community. So how do we balance that? Well, I want to talk about that for just a moment because here they are, you know, they had to call for one another. They had to bring themselves together because the mission was too great. Bringing that great catch of fish to the shore was so big that it was breaking their nets. And sometimes revival can do that. We can step into revival and, it's, and, and, and sometimes there's criticism. And you see that all over social media where people are yelling at each other over social media about doctrine or about, about issues or about practices. or You know, it's just like it's sad to see because ultimately I believe our power, our true power as the people of God is found in our unity. And our connection, our relationship with one another. Okay, so let me just bring this a little bit more forward right now. Okay, I believe that mission and community are not enemies, they're partners. That we love one another, we connect with one another, we bear with one another, we forgive one another unto the purposes of God. And so we're constantly strengthening one another, caring for one another's needs, but we're also doing that in the light of a mission, of a purpose, of a revival. And so this interesting thing is that I believe that mission will always contextualize. It will always provide a framework for community better than community will provide a framework for mission. Now that's a big thought, but let me break it down for you. In other words, when you have a group of people who have come together for whatever reason, and then a vision from God comes, usually a certain percentage of the group will say, I didn't hear that vision. In other words, vision can come, but it produces division when there's no vision. Now, vision is what God has called us to. He's given us a commission. We are called to bless the world for the glory of God. And for, that the lamb that was slain would receive the reward of his suffering. This is our mission. But mission, when it happens, produces co-workership. It produces community. We, we're all together moving towards the same destination. We're all together. Diversity, in, and we're actually supplying to one another incredible gifts and blessings and, and wisdom and one another ministry unto an outcome, okay? Where there is no vision, the Bible says the people perish. And what that word perish is, they don't die, they, they wander off from one another. They, they scatter and then they lose connection and they lose the power of unity. So how do we do both? How do we bring them together? How do we unite our sense of family, but family on a mission? If you do too much focus on the mission, then people become a utility to achieve the mission. 
Hello? Do you guys get what I'm saying there? In other words, you're necessary to me because you will have a role to play in the fulfillment of the mission, but I don't really care about you as a person. No, that's ridiculous. That is not kingdom. On the other hand, though, if we only focus on me and my needs and, and your needs and how we work together in the absence of mission, then we don't have a common direction. We don't have a common goal that we're shooting for together, a destination on the horizon that we're moving towards. So we need both. And we need them to operate in some dynamic relationship. Relationship and revival need to become partners. Okay, so turn with me to the final scripture. I want to look at the book of Romans, chapter 12. Would you turn there with me? And we're going to talk about relationship in several different dimensions. Okay, let me just read the passage to you. I'll just read the first couple of verses. They're very familiar. But he says this, I beseech you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, that you would present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may able to be able to prove or demonstrate what is that good, acceptable, perfect will of God. For I say to the grace of, uh, through the grace that is given to me, to every one among you, don't think of yourself more highly than you should, but rather you ought to think soberly as God has given to each one of us a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so each one of us in this room, being many, it says, our one body in Christ. I mean, that alone is just a big thought. Okay, we are the body of Christ. Like, we're like individual cells in a big body. And this one church, this local church called LifeSpring, is a miniature, uh, a micro expression of the body of Christ. But we know that there's 50 or 100 other good churches in our region that we are also part of the bigger body, and then we look at the nation, and we look at the planet, and we see the body of Christ universal throughout the planet, and all of us have a role to play. All of us have an immediate place of expression and connection with one another, so we're strengthening one another, so the body is strong, and the muscles are firm, and the, the bones have integrity. We are the body of Christ. We are the eyes and the ears. We are the mouth that speaks forth the word of God. We are the hands and the feet that serve the poor and the broken of this planet. Amen? Amen? I mean, this is who we are. We are the body of Christ. But how do we, how do we manifest that unity, that relational connectivity for the glory of God? Well, the first step is in verse 1. Relationship with God is primary. Present your body your human life as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. Okay, that's a contradiction in terms. I'm a sacrifice, but I'm living. Whoa, <laughs> I, I have no self-interest any longer because my interest is all shaped around Jesus. I am connected to him, I'm connected to his people, I'm connected to his purpose. And that's what governs my life. That's the rule and the reign of God and the kingdom of God is that we are his. And so we present ourselves daily. I mean, I have to do it all the time, you guys, because I, I draw away. I start getting self-centered again. I start thinking, it's all about me, Lord. And then I have to remember, no, I surrender. I bow my knees. I raise my hands. I, I give myself fully to the King of kings and the Lord of lords because he's the only one worthy to manage this life. He's the only one smart enough. He's the only one pure enough in his intentions to manage me. You guys understand? Like, otherwise, otherwise, I mess it up. I mean, whenever I think it's all about me, I start to really mess it up. So relationship with him, and it really has to be on his terms. Okay, now I have my demands. I have my expectations. I have my, you know, my, let's call it spirit of entitlement, that I bring to God, but usually that's just either ignored or brushed away, and the Lord says, no. Your place before me is on your knees, confessing your love, confessing your surrender, 
And so I go back there again and again. Okay, the second thing, though, so this is, in other words, we can't have a relationship with one another, with one another until we have a relationship with him. Okay, so a relationship with him is number one. But look at the second verse. Now, we're getting practical, you guys. Relationship with God is number one, but relationship with yourself is number two. In other words, you cannot connect with others in the way we need to as a family on mission. We cannot do it until we have enough self-awareness to be able to understand the work of God in our lives. So he says to us, do not be conformed to this world. Well, how do we get conformed? Well, obviously, we can let the economic pressures of this world shape us according to their de- demands. Or we can allow the government issues, oh, gosh, the parliament and the, the, you know, the royalty and all these issues to shape us into a different kind of person. Or we can allow media and television and the political kind of you know, discourses going on around us to shape us. But in everything, when we allow the world in fact, there's a translation called the Phillips translation. It says, don't let the world press you into its mold. So we need some self-awareness. We need to be able to say, hey, wait a minute. That is not, I'm a citizen of a different land. I'm a citizen of heaven. I am bound to Jesus Christ. I have presented myself as a living sacrifice. I need to understand me. Because if I don't understand me, if I'm narcissistic or or distracted, I'm not going to see myself clearly. I'm not going to let others speak into my life clearly, and I'm not going to be able to build the kinds of relationships that will facilitate revival. Okay, so I need to be self-aware. And that's what it says here in verse 3. It says, I say through the grace given to me, every one of you not to think of himself more highly than he ought. You know, I, I've been a Christian a long time, and, you know, I'm so sad by how many believers that I know who are still the sun in their personal solar system. You guys understand what I'm talking about. It's like, wait a minute, that's not what Jesus died to produce. You know, that Jesus would just be one of the planets rotating around me because I'm so amazing, I'm so awesome, and I'm so worthy that really Jesus really owes it to me to kind of become one of my planets and actually help me out in life. No. <laughs> he, he is our Savior, yes, but he is also our Lord. In other words, we have now moved from being the sun in our solar system to being one of the planets, and Jesus now is the center that I rotate around. You guys understand. And that this, but this requires a subjugation. It requires a, a humility and a humiliation. I need to dethrone myself from the throne of my heart and establish him in the center of my life. But that takes a certain amount of self awareness because we are self deceived in many cases. We just blind ourselves. But I can't relate to you as Jesus would have me relate to you, as long as I'm the center of my universe. You guys get that? So, knowing him, relating to him, and then relating to me, and then comes relating to you. And that's what it goes to the next verse. He says this. He says, for as we have many members, I mean, look around this room. Just take a look. I mean, just look at the diversity Diversity of age, diversity of skin color, diversity of backgrounds and histories, nationalities even. We have so much beautiful diversity, and that is in the very heart of God. You, you, you see God actually created diversity in the world by confusing the languages in Genesis 11, that God himself was the one who actually says he will gather every people, every tongue, every tribe before his throne, and we will all fall on our knees saying, holy, 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 amen? That's our destiny. We are a diverse community coming together for the glory of God. It's so beautiful. But he says this. He says, we're many members, but we're one body. So what is the relationship between diversity and unity? Unity is not uniformity. Hello? We don't want everybody to look alike. We don't want everybody to think alike. We want there to be different gifts expressed, different other things alive. You guys understand? We want to see 
the beauty of Jesus expressed in the myriad of colors, the myriad of ideas, the myriad of thoughts, the myriad of expressions, where we bring it all together for his glory. Okay, And so that's what we see in this next passage. We being many are one body in Christ. We're individually members of one another. So we're part of this bigger thing, but we're also different from one another. So we have to reconcile. How do we do this? Well, he talks about then in the next few verses the gifts that he gives us. Some people call these the motivational gifts that some of you, let me just read it really quickly. You'll get an idea. Gifts differing from one another in verse 6. He says, if prophecy, then prophesy according to your faith. If ministry, which means serving one another, use it in ministering. If, he, if you're teachers, then teach you know, and, and then if you're exhorting with exhortation, with, with give, he who gives with liberality, that's just financial and resource giving. He who leads with diligence. In other words, he's listing all these different attributes, seven of them. And then finally, he says mercy. Every one of us has one or more of these gifts at work in our lives. But in order to express Jesus fully, every one of us, needs to contribute and connect with others because we only have a small piece of Jesus. When he ascended on high, he gave gifts, but he didn't give the totality of himself to one person. He gave an aspect of himself so that we would need the person sitting next to us. And when we come together in this dynamic relationship, relationship produces revival. I want to encourage you that you have a future. You have a hope in this church that God has not ordained this church for nothing. God has ordained that you would become a radical expression of the body of Christ, that every one of you bringing your gifts, laying them at the apostles' feet, then uniting with one another around a common sense of mission, you become a people related to one another, producing great outcome for God's kingdom. Now, final verse. Turn with me to the book of John, chapter 13, verse 35. John 13, 35. And as we look there, I just want you to realize that this is such an amazing punctuation of what we're talking about today. He says this in verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you would love one another. <laughs> What a novel thought, right? But how can we love one another? We must love God first. We must know ourselves well. But then we must begin to see each other through the eyes of Jesus. Now, when you're working together, walking together in a church for many years, there can be wear and tear on your nets. Hello? You can start to form judgments about one another. Oh, so-and-so, they're always whatever. You know, we can start to judge. We can start to make vows. I will never trust another leader again in my life. I will, you know, it's like we start to form opinions and have attitudes that keep us from loving one another. But look what he says here. He says, love one another as I have loved you. Now, that separates the babies from the adults, okay? If that is the bar that I'm called to love the person sitting next to me, the person in the row in front of me, if I'm called to love you in the same way Jesus loves me, I have to just admit that it's impossible without his presence. Without his power, I'm unable to fulfill this command. But look what he says. By this... All men, all women, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. In other words, God has given the world permission to judge the authenticity of our love for him. God has given the world permission to judge whether we are the real church or not. And the basis on which that judgment will occur, the world will know that you're my disciples because of the way you relate to one another, the way you love one another, the way you serve one another, the way you bless one another. 
other, the way you forgive one another. In other words, every single thing that Jesus has commanded in his words are the essential expression that the world has been given permission to judge us by. They will know that we're his disciples when they see the love. And the love is symbolized by the net. Are we connecting? Are we connecting to one another in such a way that when the harvest comes, we can make room for the babies? We can have nets big enough for the catch of fish that God has ordained for this church? And can we bring those fish in and love them into maturity in Christ? Amen? So I would like to pray as we close. Is that okay, Pastor? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you feel like your net has become a little bit damaged, maybe there's been some church hurt in your life in the past, maybe there's been a little bit of uh, just friction between you and another member of this church, or maybe some church or pastor in the past in your life, and you know you need to mend your nets right now for what God's about to do. You know that there's a need. Can I just ask you to stand to your feet? Now, I'm standing because I know I need this. Could you guys stand with me? I mean, I want to pray for you. I want to see the nets mended. I want to see the faith restored. I want to see the, the hope re, uh, return so that we can be the instrument of heaven so that we can be, when Jesus says, cast your net one more time, that we can cast ourselves into the mission of God, not just because we love him, and not just because we've examined ourselves, but because we are part of a net that has been healed. And now it's time for us to cast it. So can I just ask those of you standing around, or sitting around those who are standing to just stand with them right now. Could you stand up and just... Put your hand on somebody that's, that's standing. This is the body. This is how we love one another, you guys, is that we pray for one another, we serve one another, we bless one another. And if you haven't stood but you need to, just stand up right now and just put your hand up high and we'll stand with you. Just put your hand up if, if, if you want prayer for this because we need Jesus right now, you guys. We are on the verge of a great ingathering of souls, but we must be healthy enough. We must be loving enough to be able to receive them. So in the name of Jesus, Lord, I ask you to lay your hands on every man and woman who stood today. Lord, I ask that you would cause whatever wounds have been afflicted upon them, whatever misunderstandings, whatever uh, areas of offense, areas of judgment that have been brought. Lord, I pray right now a cancellation of every single root of pain, every moment of abuse, every difficulty that might have damaged your heart and kept you from wanting to re-engage. I right now in the name of Jesus break the power of those painful words, those painful actions, those difficult moments. And right now in the name of Jesus, I want you to speak forgiveness over any person or any, any organization that might have been instrumental in harming you, just as an act of faith, say, I forgive them in Jesus' name. Just declare it right now. I forgive you. I forgive my brother. I forgive my sister. I forgive that pastor once upon a time who hurt me. I forgive in Jesus' name. And Lord, I ask you to cleanse my net Mend my net right now. Can you guys just say that out loud? Mend my net, oh God. Mend my net so that I can be part of this great ingathering that's about to happen, Lord. I don't want to miss it. I don't want to be sitting on the sidelines with my arms crossed, scowling at those that are, that are simple faith people. I want to dive in with both feet. I want to jump into what God's doing and be part of his redemptive mission. But Lord, give me grace to build the relationships. Give me grace to build the connections that will help me be a part of that amazing statement. They will know that you are my disciples because of the love that you have for one another. 
Amen? Man, God bless you guys. Thanks so much for having us here. Stay standing. Okay, please stay standing right where you are. Ministry team, come forward. We have a good five minutes or more. Ministry team, come. Those of you that stood for prayer, I just felt the Holy Spirit saying, it's not finished yet. Just come and do a, a, a real response now. Come to the front and the ministry team will pray for you. Don't, don't, don't go halfway with this. Go all the way. Get prayer from the front now. So can we stand together and we're just going to worship the Lord for a few minutes. And uh, thank you, Michael, so much for that, that word. It's so important. I felt the Lord say, you know, on, the, on that first one, the first principle, surrender to Jesus. There's someone here who needs to take that step right now. You need to take, you need to cross that line and make that decision. Jesus is my Savior today. I'm going to invite him in to my heart. I'm going to settle the issue. Can we just close our eyes for a moment? And while I'm praying, please, those of you that were stood earlier, you just make your way to the front while we're praying. That's absolutely fine. And we'll just keep things rolling. Now just say this prayer in your heart if that's you that needs to surrender to Jesus. Heavenly Father, let's say this together. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me and sending Jesus to die in my place. And now I come to you and I surrender my life to Christ. Forgive me of my sin and come into my heart. Be my Savior and Lord today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now thank Him. Just thank Him in your heart. Just say thank you. Thank you to Jesus. Thank you to Jesus. And if you prayed that prayer, I want you to give me a wave right now. If you prayed that prayer, there's a lady to my left here. There's a guy right to the back here. I saw your hand. Anybody else? Anyone else? Somebody right here? Okay, bless you, lady in the second row. There's someone right over there. That's four. Is there a number five? Is there a fifth one? Somebody else? Okay, you four people come to the front right now. Church, give them a big hand as they come. Those of you that raised your hand, come. If you're with a friend, bring bring your friend. Bless you. Come, that's it. God bless you. That's wonderful. And ministry team, Bossy, where are you? Please come and come and help us with these people. Um, amen. I'm looking for Shagan. Just going to need it. Okay. All right. Ronnie, would you help with these people that came to surrender their lives to Christ? They're down here. Thank you, Laura. We'll get that organized. Okay. I'm going to hand over to the worship team. And... Uh, God bless you. Thank you. Let's enjoy his presence. Ministry time is open. Amen. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgive.